Hello and welcome. My name is Deborah Guthrie and joining me for this Wisdom Wednesday interview is Stephen Gibas. He is the IT Director, that's Information Technology Director at Meridian Township. Thank that's you right. so much for joining me. Happy to be here. So this kind of came about because uh, you've been to my office a couple of times. On more than one occasion, we come down and we talk to you about all kinds of computer-related stuff. It's always a pleasure. It's, <laughs> so once in a while, I'll have computer issues, or maybe um, I think that I've received spam, and so I've asked you for your advice on it. Um, but before we get to, because I do want to talk about uh, sec Internet security at the township, mm -hmm. I want to talk about... Um, how we can be better aware of spam and, and saving our identity um, from getting stolen online. But before we get to that, could you talk about what you do? What does information technology mean? Because I know you do a, a gamut of things. Yeah, ac actually, the, it's changing every day, right? The one thing that we know if you, if you talk to anyone about technology is 10 years ago, the things that we think about today were not issues or not uh, things that we even considered as part of the everyday technology's workspace. Phone systems used to be standalone and do their jobs for, uh, for people at their desks. Email systems were burgeoning and starting to you know, become really widely used. Uh, social media, uh, also a great tool to communicate with people, uh, a large number of people in a very short amount of time. Uh, these are all things that have kind of merged together and you know even here when we talk about the network resources that we have and uh, the fact that the network is converged which simply means that we use it for data we use it for telephone we use it for social media we mm -hmm. use it for any type of communication you can think of and some you might not even think about uh, in terms of the thermostats are tied into the network that we use temperature sensors moisture sensors video cameras all plugged into the exact same network sending data to and from wherever we needed to do your job hopefully my job uh, it doesn't matter who we're working with here at the township 99 percent of us need some access to some kind of data uh, as we're doing our day-to-day -day responsibilities most jobs have changed over time. Mm -hmm. um, yours has really changed. I mean, we didn't even have internet until the township didn't have internet until 98, 99, 2000. It depends on what you call internet, but we, uh, before, I'm going to go back and say probably 1998, we had multiple small scale systems that were providing limited internet access for one or two. Uh, for one or two services like this email account mm -hmm. uh, or we had somebody who was hooked up to the World Wide Web to do research on uh, what other communities were doing for planning or whatever. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until probably in actually 1996 to 1998 that we had a real consolidation. We replaced a lot of technology throughout the entire organization. Mm -hmm. um, our fiber connecting our buildings actually goes back to 1992. Right. So there's a lot of pieces that have been in place, but it was 1996 to 1998 that we really looked at all of those pieces of infrastructure that had come along for their individual projects and combined it into a consolidated system uh, where we were focused on providing communication and telecommunication and data communication resources at all of our nine to 10 facilities, depending on what you're counting for Meridian Township. How long have you been with the township? I started in January of 1991. Okay, in January yeah. of 1991. And so at that time, what were you overseeing? I, I was actually was doing nothing with, uh, with technology at all. Um, I was hired by the engineering department excuse me, as a uh, project engineer. Okay. So some of the first things that I did here, uh, I designed the sidewalk up on Birch Row. No way. Uh, yeah. Really? Huh. So uh, that it was fun. Uh, it, civil engineering is an absolutely fantastic career. It gets you outside when the weather's uh, not too bad most of the time, mm -hmm. and you're inside in the winter doing all your designs and whatever else. Uh, I did sidewalks, uh, a couple of bridge projects I worked uh, worked on. Uh, there were water main projects. We got into the uh, pumping station over on Doby Road from time to time. Lots of talk about um, the towers that we pump the water up into and maintaining pressure and then getting water samples over to our treatment plants and all those things. Uh, can't give enough credit to Eunice Schrady, who really took mm -hmm. me under his wing those first couple of years I was here. Taught me a lot of stuff. Uh, got me involved in a lot of those great public works projects. It was a fantastic time. And so how did you transition? into what you're doing today. Well, Obviously, technology played yeah. a major role. Um, 
Yeah, uh, technology was in an interesting place here at Meridian Township. In 1992, uh, we did a lot of those basic infrastructure projects, but the entire technology infrastructure was being overseen by four separate people in four departments here in the township. We had uh, two people up in the assessing department, one in utility billing, uh, and then... I, I, I should remember. Oh, and then the treasurer's office was the fourth person. These four people got together on a weekly basis and took over all the administrative responsibilities for um, building the network and making the technology tools in place that everyone needed to do their job. Hmm. Um, the problem was it was really difficult to keep up with all the demands. Mm -hmm. So uh, when they talked about what they were going to transition to next, um, there was a lot of discussion, and I was involved in it because I was doing a lot of the computer-aided design work up in the engineering department. I was mm -hmm. very familiar with the AutoCAD that they used and some of the GIS functions they were doing at that time. Uh, so I was involved in helping to write the job description uh, that we wanted to do for a network administrator back in 1996. We went through four or five rounds of interviews and were really underwhelmed by the people who were uh, throwing their their hat in the ring and part of that's because the four people that we had who had been doing all the work up until that point were really talented people and um, the only problem was they didn't have enough time to do the network administration piece well after several rounds of interviews uh, the township manager sat down with everybody involved and we made a decision that maybe it would make more sense to put one of the people interior to the organization in, in charge of all of that. Mm -hmm. And then we would go and replace uh, my, uh, my position as a project engineer. They felt that they could fill that relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. And they felt that I would probably serve the township very effectively in that role for at least a couple of years was all we were talking about at that point. So that was back in 1996. And that was that Jerry Richards? That was Jerry Richards okay. and Peggy Lidgard, Tom Minter. Um, yeah, uh, Pat Hilliard and oh. Jim Myers. Okay. All right. And so since that time, um, you know, a lot, I, I know you have to put a lot of security measures in place. I know um, you probably live here. People no. You probably, you probably work here more than any other employee. Do I'm here at unusual hours, but yes. uh, yeah, that's any, any, any of the people who have jobs where you have 24 hours worth of infrastructure that you're watching over. There are times when you're gonna be called in at eight o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night or four o'clock in the morning, depending on whatever. 6 a.m. is a really popular time for us to come in because both our police and fire departments are switching over. So a lot of times there are things that come up outside of that regular eight to five job. And, and when you do maintenance and mm -hmm. updates and those sort of things, oh, obvi obviously staff is going to want those things to be not while they're working and yeah and there are times where we have to do after our maintenance but fortunately mm -hmm. uh, technology has really in and of its own uh, f sense of, of momentum has developed a lot of redundancy built into many of the systems that we oversee so we can actually do a large number of the updates while everyone's here and you won't even notice because while we're updating server A, server B takes over and mm -hmm. handles the load uh, and then we bring server A uh, back up fully to speed and then we take server B down to do the upgrade. So a lot of them happen during the day. Not all of them can happen that way, but we're to the place where most of our planned updates are either taking place during the day or in the 5 to 6 p.m. hour mm -hmm. uh, that isn't that isn't really considered overtime for us the way that we we schedule things out for the most part how does the township work with neighboring municipalities i know it's it's uh it's gone through ebbs and and flows over the years mm -hmm. uh, i go back to you know 1990 uh 1996 1997 we had a very comprehensive uh relationship with the city of east lansing rod taylor was their director of technology over there and he was doing some absolutely fantastic things for that for him uh, and the city uh, we were doing a lot of the same things or wanting to expand into uh, the bits and pieces maybe that we hadn't done yet because we were a little bit nervous about some of the costs so mm -hmm. rod and i collaborated on a bunch of projects and that's when you saw our groupwise email system really take hold here and our mm -hmm. connection to the internet and spread, spreading all the internet connections, consolidating those into one high speed connection where we could do some centralized reporting and monitoring and add a little bit of security trying to keep from 
uh, having viruses or other malware uh, find their way onto our network very easily. So there were some security pieces that we did together. Really exciting time. Uh, that expanded uh, with Ingham County over uh, a, the decade after that. Mm -hmm. Lots of projects with them as well. Uh, and even today, uh, we have a group of people that are meeting from City of Mason, City of Williamston, uh, Lansing Township, Meridian Township, City of Lansing, City of East Lansing, Michigan State University, mm -hmm. all get together about four to five times a year to talk about the different things we're doing with technology and how we might collaborate or do things differently or even just look at what the other other partners doing uh, to maybe uh, cheat a little bit and borrow some some of the successes that they've had in their those arenas. Is it tied in regionally? Is our network tied in with some of the other systems? You know, when we look at, um, you know, 911 and how that functions and how it uh, you know, you have Ingham County, you know, Office of Homeland Security and 911, and how does that tie in with Meridian Township's network, if at all? Yeah, so, uh, number one, in today's world, uh, internet means we're connected to everybody all the time. So yeah. we have direct connections to those through things called virtual private networks, and that's where we create a special tunnel from Meridian Township over the internet to say the state of Michigan and we mm -hmm. share data with them over that virtual private networking tunnel. Mm -hmm. um, so we have connections like that. Uh, so but you're, that's, say, you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. you're saying people aren't surfing in that private tunnel. It's that, just those people who are allowed. A, a, not only those, those people that are allowed, but certain functions. Like that mm -hmm. would be for our police records management system. We share a system that is used by the state, mm -hmm. and we use that virtual private network to connect to them. Okay. So that is a one type of internet-based connection that is specially for government that we utilize on a day-to-day -day basis that connects us to the state police. And so you would oversee the township's portion of that, how it's connected to that. Exactly right. So okay. you would, uh, when the police wanted to establish that, I put uh, most of the circuits uh, that are currently being used in place, and we created the software and hardware on both ends to actually establish that connection. Now there's other types of connections that are a little bit more direct. We don't use the internet at all because we may have uh, sensitivity of the type of information that we're transferring that we don't want it to even be out on the internet mm -hmm. for anybody to look at it along the way. And for those types of connections, we have, uh, we do have also point to point connections that connect us directly to Ingham County and then on to the state of Michigan. Okay. Other point to point connections that still connect us to the city of East Lansing, uh, where we share a fire records management system. So there's a lot of HIP information that is stored on a server at the city of East Lansing that our fire departments all access at their individual fire stations. That also, not using the internet at all for those connections, it's a private point-to-point -point connection. Uh, all that's run by my, my department. How often do you have to up, update those connections? No, very rarely. Okay. Um, uh, Prob I probably should update them more often than I do from the perspective of uh, the original connections that we have to our north and south fire station where we have two firefighters on duty at any given time are still running the old T1s, which are limited to about 1.5 megabit per second uh, speed. It's mm. really mm -hmm. a low speed in comparison <laughs> to what we, we do today. We're all rolling our eyes right now yeah. hearing that. <laughs> uh, but keep in mind, we have one computer in those locations, mm -hmm. and then we have the building full of telephones, and then we have special prioritization uh, techniques that we use to make sure that no matter what, the important pieces of information, be it a phone call to a firefighter telling them that, you know, they, they've had a problem and they need to go someplace, mm -hmm. or um, say a uh, uh, one of the crier phones out front where you go to a fire station and you'll see the 911 box when you pick that open, making sure that that call is going to go through to the 911 center every time mm -hmm. someone picks up that phone. Those are all prioritized, uh, especially to make sure that um, they get to where they need to go at the time they need to go. And they have quick response times, so they we have, know that there's not it's not slowing them down in any that's way. That's not slowing them down. Actually, the dialing equipment can slow them down a little bit in that location, but the 1.5 megabit per second, that's relatively slow connection, is not slowing down the telephone call at all. That's more than enough bandwidth as long as we make sure that that telephone call is prioritized. So that's another thing that my department would do is making sure that we've got the right rules in place so that the right things happen when the person picks up that phone. Uh, your download from YouTube is probably going to slow down a little bit as that telephone gets picked up if you're at one of those stations. Um, 
The reason that we use those old slower connections actually goes back to a service level agreement more than the bandwidth. Okay. They're a special kind of circuit and they're prioritized by the telephone companies to get them back into service quicker than hmm. maybe some of the DSL or other high speed services. I okay. could upgrade them to a hundred meg service, but uh, it's it's probably going to be for those two users that are out there. It's probably going to be on something that gets repaired in the second or third pass, as opposed to the T ones that AT and T in this case uh, will have out. Somebody will be out repairing it within four hours of any service interruption that we have with them. Do you work with the companies often on speeds and connectivity and? Yeah, right now. So. We built our fire station, the new central fire station, a few years back, and we've been working on a new fiber connection to them to mm -hmm. actually b bump the speeds. That's been a long, ongoing project, longer than it should be, but mm -hmm. we're excited that it's finally, the end is finally in sight, and we're going to be able to offer a uh, hundred or a gigabit uh, per second connection out to that fire station sometime within the next couple of weeks. Do you uh, have, have any uh, work to do with the cell tower that's that's on township property. Um, so we don't have any resources or assets there. Yeah. Uh, it's right outside my office. Uh, I do contact the people from time to time. Most of the time, if there's an alarm or something going off there, uh, it's not uncommon for me to be the one who notices it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very common if someone hears something to come say, hey, do you know what's going on down there? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm a point of contact, but not a, uh, there's a lot of people who would be more officially uh, involved in that particular agreement than I would be. When you uh, have to update computers, uh, not mm -hmm. necessarily the ones in, in offices, but maybe the uh, laptops for the police officers, uh, how much work is involved with that? And is it tied at all to those those new body cameras that they have? And, are, uh, and do you have to work with them on those body cameras? Yeah, so the body cameras use the same types of networks that we're talking about for all the rest of these things. So yes, we do help the police department set up the different uh, wireless infrastructures that are used to transfer that video data from a body camera uh, to um, a Wi-Fi hotspot uh, in the back lot if it's coming from a car or from the dock that's if it's coming from uh, one of the actual body cameras. Uh, when the officer comes in at the end of his shift, he'll drop his body camera into a dock that's connected to the network. And hmm. then all of that video, if, whether it's from the car or the officer's personal body camera, or you may not realize on their tasers, some of their tasers actually have cameras embedded. Really? Yeah, so when they're, when they're pointing a taser at somebody, there's a camera right there showing exactly wow. what they're pointing at. There's no question about, uh, you know, a, were, were we pointing it at this person or not? No, that's where the camera was, and you can mm -hmm. see whether they're uh, exactly what's happening. But all of that video gets swept into mm -hmm. an up channel. We have a server here that collects most of it, mm -hmm. uh, but then it gets uh, all put out on the internet uh, in a safe, secure location uh, where it can be referenced, edited, uh, redacted if required. And then if uh, if it needs to go to like the prosecuting attorney's office, they simply send a link to the video. If it needs to go to a defense attorney, they simply send a link of the video. Man, a lot more information being shared. Oh uh, yeah, than than ever before, and that's, uh, it, if you think about the the most impactful changes over the next ten years, I'm yeah. all but positive that it's going to be every shred of information that we have is going to become more and more available. Mm -hmm. um, How do you store all of that? Well, it's a challenge, right? And we have, uh, you know, we're lucky. Meridian mm -hmm. Township is. Uh, lucky from the perspective of we're not that big mm -hmm. and we're also not that small. We're, we're big enough to have enough budget to buy the computers and resources to do a lot of this stuff on site, uh, but uh, we're also small enough that when it makes sense, we can leverage these great internet-based services, these cloud, people will say cloud, that's a buzzword, but mm -hmm. all we're really talking is about a site out on the internet where they have disk storage and they'll sell it to us for a really good cost Mm -hmm. uh, we just have to contract with them and then we can put whatever we want to out there and coordinate uh, what we want to in terms of whether we retain it for, you know, a week or mm -hmm. seven years or mm -hmm. 20 years or whatever we want. And does this include, uh, does the network include anything to do with the water treatment plant and East Lansing? Is there, is there any of that system that's involved with this at all? So. 
Uh, the short answer is yes, because like I said, everything's interconnected. Yeah. But our public works department has a system called SCADA. And now I am I should have looked it up before, but it's like computerized digital data acquisition. And what that means is that for like our sewer, occasionally we have to have pumps. There's 28 or 29 pumps throughout the township mm -hmm. that take sewage and pump it up to a higher level so that it can flow by gravity down to the sewer treatment plant on the hmm. other side of East Lansing. All 28 or 29 of those stations have equipment inside that talk to computers back here. And if something goes wrong at any of those stations, if it loses power, if the pump stops running, if even though the pump's running, the volume's going up too high, there's all these alerts that will automatically call our on-call person for public works. Weekend, middle of the night, doesn't matter. They get a telephone call saying, uh, there's a problem with lift station 28 coming out and take a look and uh, that allows us to go home and sleep at night with a little <laughs> bit of little bit of uh, uh, sanity knowing that somebody's looking after that stuff and if there's a problem we're going to hear about it hopefully before it becomes a problem for someone else and what about the the Wi-Fi meter readers what about those those um, come back here and store that gets sent somewhere you know when the guys go out the public I shouldn't say guys when the public works employees go out or and they are doing the meter reader. Oh, yeah. Do you call it? What, what do you call it? Yeah, so our meter reading, you're talking about our water meter yes. reading systems. Uh, those actually are, are not Wi-Fi. They're not. That, those are radio in base. Oh. And uh, we have a truck that drives up and down the street. Right. And as long as it's within about 40 or 50 feet of the little puck that's connected to the water meter, they can drive down the street at about 15 or 20 miles an hour, and as they pass each house, it uses a radio signal to send the current water meter. I thought it was Wi-Fi. It's radio. Yeah, it's okay. radio, and Wi-Fi is radio too. But when you say Wi-Fi, the frequency wifi, is the frequencies actually are very similar. Are they? But the protocol that's used is completely different. When we say Wi-Fi, what we really mean is a radio-based network that a portable computer or a fixed computer if you want, but mm -hmm. a computer can connect to it using the Wi-Fi 802.11, uh, whichever one, A, B, C, D, G, N, mm -hmm. T, there's a million different protocols, but okay. that Wi-Fi router uses that protocol over that radio frequency to establish a Wi-Fi connection. Our meters don't use Wi-Fi, but they use radio. In a oh. lot of ways, it's very similar. Okay. Interesting thing I learned. Yeah. So what do you what do you recommend um, for you know for staff and for uh, residents with protecting you know their identity and cybersecurity? There's a lot of scams going out there, and and it's easy for people. It's easier uh, now for people to be duped into thinking that this is a legit email or they should legitimately give this information to someone. You know, it just seems like this is happening more frequently. Yeah, and there, there have been some really elaborate scans over the last even five and ten years, but they're becoming uh, a little bit more uh, elaborate, uh, but uh, probably just as scary. Um, they're a lot more pervasive than they were five or ten years ago. Um, first of all, I think the most important thing is for you to, before you get the telephone call, somebody calling you and saying, hey, this is Microsoft support and you have a problem with your computer, uh, I'm going to help you fix it right now. And then the next thing you know, they're charging you $200 on your visa. And then they are, uh, they're helping you fix a problem that I don't want to say doesn't exist, but in reality, they don't know of any problems that exist. That's a cold call. Mm -hmm. uh, and what they're doing is they're fishing for information. They're trying to get you to tell them enough information so they can start to uh, figure out how to get connected to your computer and then provide quote unquote a service. Um, th the interesting piece of a lot of those scams is their whole goal is to trick you into saying the words, yes, I'm willing to do this. And once you say, uh, here's my credit card number, you're, you're giving mm -hmm. tacit approval for that person to do whatever work it is. And in the people who I've worked with over the last five or 10 years, you know, there's 10 or 15 people who have called me and said, oh, I think I just messed up. I just gave somebody access to my computer. Uh, in many cases, the, the credit card companies will not refund mm -hmm. the money that was charged, even though 
we were calling them on another line saying, no, they just they just tricked him into giving his credit card. They're like, well, are they providing a service? Mm -hmm. And did the subscriber agree to the service? And if the answer to both those questions are yes, the people on the other end are feeling like they won the day and they're getting their 120 or 220 or whatever they're charging for that particular thing. Now, I will say the companies that I've seen doing those kinds of things, they get in and they run... They do run scans and they'll try and clean up this and your computer probably will run better, but it's an overpriced service. You could do it for less if you took your computer into our local Best Buy right here in Meridian Township. Mm -hmm. A great place to have people that you know and trust and can go back to uh, in the event that there's a problem someplace else down the road. Also, don't be afraid to ask your co-workers. Your tech team is almost always happy to come talk to you a little bit about what you can do to be safer at home. like. Uh, make sure you've got a good antivirus pro product. Uh, there's four or five of them. In many cases, they're completely free to you. Mm. Uh, Comcast, AT&T, both provide it as part of their monthly uh, subscription service. So mm -hmm. if you're paying them, you know, whatever you pay for your internet, $60, $70, $80, dollars whatever that is, uh, you're getting a subscription to antivirus for that that you can load on up to five computers at your home, depending mm. on the provider. Okay. Uh, so, that's a no cost thing for you. You just have to find the download, install it on your computer, or again, talk to one of your tech friends about coming over. It's like a five minute thing. We don't mind doing it at all. And oh my gosh, it should probably take me an hour, Stephen. No, yeah. <laughs> I should probably figure it out. <laughs> that, and that, so call, call the people Call the people who know how to do it. It's not a big installation and we'll get it done for you really quick. Call my son real yeah. quick. <laughs> and then the other thing I'll say is, like I said, I've received telephone calls over the years where somebody said, oh, I just let him in. Don't be afraid to do that. We would much rather you call us yeah. and have us come, you know, drop what we're doing and come help you make it hopefully a difficult situation better. We're very happy to do that anytime we can. I mean, obviously, for at work, sometimes you can't just, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, Township Manager Walsh, uh, we're walking out right now because <laughs> my uncle has a virus infection and whatever. It doesn't always work that way. I don't but know. He's pretty family friendly. Actually, he's, he is, he's, he's a huge family supporter. He probably would say, yeah, yeah. He'd go, say, get, I, get, why are you telling me this? That's go take just care of help. it. Go take care of it. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, but we're happy to help and go count on those resources. Also, there's some great online scanning util utilities out there as well. House Call is one by um, Trend Micro, uh, which is a very famous security company. Uh, for years, it's been great about giving you a really good scan uh, online at no cost to you um, and tell you whether you have a problem or not. And Again, your tech friends can point you at those, but housecall.trendmicro.com is where it has always been historically, and I bet anyone can go there right now, and within two minutes, they'll have a scan running on their computer, and then uh, that'll say, hey, you've got some problems here that we can help you clean up, uh, and or um, they, they may say then, you know what, we'd really like to sell you our house call product, and then we'll clean up these pro these problems for you automatically online, but for a lot less than a than mm -hmm. 120 or 220 dollars, or whatever that that scamming person is going to try and charge you. And what about what do you have to say about cell phones? Seems like our entire life is going on our cell phones, our credit cards, and everything. Yeah. So this is, uh, and we could talk about PC versus Mac and iPhone versus Android, and there's a lot of other things. But this is one place where I really try to remember, especially uh, Apple people. Um, for those of us who use the Careful, Apple, you got Apple people in the room here, Steven. <laughs> right, right here, right here. All right, all right. I got my Apple in my pocket right now. <laughs> but um, we have uh, uh, the iPhone is by far the most popular handheld telephone device in the world right now. And as a result, it is a higher profile than like your Mac computers, mm -hmm. your AirBooks and your AirBook Pros and your what Mac. What does that mean when you say a higher profile? Um, so because there are so many iPhones in the world, that's something that people really like to try and get their hooks into a little bit and maybe steal a little data. Now, Apple does a pretty good job of keeping all your different uh, pieces compartmentalized. So my phone can't directly talk to my Wi-Fi mm -hmm. uh, like can happen in the Android world. But for people who jailbreak their Apple devices, uh, it can make you a little bit more susceptible to those types of malware or... Uh, it's not really technically a virus unless it copies itself, mm -hmm. but uh, malicious software of some type uh, that could run on your your Apple telephone and then uh, maybe leak your data or mm 
Uh, there's a, a lot of different pieces of things that could happen uh, if you're not careful with your, your telephone device. Yeah, it can, it's, it's scary. You know, you put your credit cards on there and you have profile information on there and you're, uh, all these apps with all your um, passwords. And do you, have a, do you have a recommendation for, for password security or, or, or anything? I'm not going to share how, how I save my passwords. I'm probably doing it wrong. There's three or four well-known companies out there that have products that help you save your passwords. Uh, here at the township, we use a product called KeyPass, and what it does is it allows you to create a master password that's very secure uh, and very easy to update if we need to, but inside of that uh, password secured file, we keep a copy of all of the rest of our passwords. Mm -hmm. um, How uh, do I do that at home? That's well, what I need to be able to do at home. Uh, KeyPass is actually open source and free to you to use to download okay. whatever else. Uh, if there's a there's a site called SourceForge, which does a lot of open source projects, which means um, uh, coders and developers out there say, this is something that the world should really have. And they get together and in their free time and spare time, they develop uh, little applications like this that really provide a good service. You know, there's ones for zipping up and unzipping files. There's ones for keeping track of your passwords, whatever else. You could take a look at a host of other uh, mm -hmm. more um, uh, established companies like uh, LogMeIn has their LastPass product where they really work with you to build a digital identity that they help you maintain online in a real world environment. But of course, those types of services are going to have a little bit of a cost to them, probably, you know, $10 uh, a month or maybe uh, $50 a year, depending on which pieces of the puzzle that you're buying from them. Now, you have a couple of projects coming up, and I just want to ask about those briefly. Sure. Um, you're upgrading the phone system yes. at Meridian Township. I'm, I assume that's tied, in, tied into the network. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, it's, all the phones. It's, it's ones and zeros. Yep. It's all, uh, it's all tied in. The phones plug into the wall, and in your case, your computer actually plugs into the phone using the same network to move voice and data across uh, all so of the So it's all transferring facilities. data together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you have that project coming up. Um, and then, you know, I'm going to have uh, I'm going to have Director um, Madison on here, our Finance Director Miriam Madison on here to talk about a new uh, point and pay system that's coming up. Invoice Cloud. Invoice Cloud. Uh, do you have to do a lot with that in regards to, you know, security measures for people who are choosing point and pay and that kind of thing with a township website? Uh, the great answer is no, because we've got a lot of great directors who have already chosen to work with companies who are very security minded. Uh, you, of course, work with Vision Internet, who was bought out by Granicus, um, and they provide uh, a lot of the back end services in terms of the security certificates and the other things to make sure that the information that's coming from our website can be verified that it's coming from Meridian Charter Township. Mm -hmm. uh, the same is true with Director Madison and the Invoice Cloud product that she chose. The company, Invoice Cloud, is very security minded. They handle all of the PCI compliance stuff that is would be cumbersome or difficult for us to do. They're handling that in their main offices. The product is built from the ground up to be secure hmm. with very established paths in and out of our network in terms of how we share information, update information. So as you say, you check the box saying, I want to be text to pay next month and I want you to text me what my bill is and I'm just going to I'm going to hit the reply button and then I'm going to send, send the text saying pay and all of a sudden with the information that Invoice Cloud has collected at that very secure site, um, your bills are automatically paid without you having to worry about Meridian Township losing track of your credit card number if you if you're choosing to pay by credit card. And not or sending ACH. me not sending me a bill either to my house. I'm so yeah. excited about that. Not um, having a piece of mail. And that that was one of the pieces that we really loved about Invoice Cloud was there's like 27 or 29 different customization options for each person. If you want reminders. They'll send you email reminders, text reminders. Um, if you forget to pay, like you say, oh, I'm never going to forget to pay or whatever, they can set up, you know, emergency reminders saying, hey, you know, if you don't get this paid today, uh, we're going to have to send you or you'll get a late charge. But all that stuff is fully customizable by the customer, however they want to do it. And uh, like I said, so many options that it would have been difficult for us to do without help from a company like Invoice Cloud. Any other projects you want to mention or uh, tips? 
that we should know for security? Uh, everyone should own a shredder in their house. Uh, if you're getting paper with any types of financial information, those credit card uh, offers that you get should all be. Uh, they should. They should Even should the credit card offers should be shredded. Well, those should be shredded. Anything with your name with your name on it saying they want to extend you credit. Uh, just uh, get, get shred rid of it before stuff. you put it in the recycle bin. Yeah, uh, or should it go to a secure shredding shredding location? No, just shred it before shred it before. You just don't want to be the easiest person to have somebody yeah. rifle through and say, "Oh, look, that's a credit card thing. I'm just going to change the address," and the next thing you know, uh, they've got a credit card in your name. It's not quite that easy, mm -hmm. but shred it. Um, uh, get rid of that stuff at home. Uh, if you have questions about your computer, ha have your Nieces, nephews, we all know somebody who can come in and give us a, so a, true. a quick hand to look and see, does this look right? You know, is my antivirus configured the way that I want? Is my mm -hmm. dad profile up to date? Those are all things that we're very happy to do anytime we can. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you so much for yeah. coming on. I'm so glad. I don't, I don't know the last time you've been on a program. It's It's been years. I think we were talking about, uh, the last time we were talking about some something to do with security as well. All right. So we'll have you back on here. It's not going to be years. We'll have you okay. back on by the end of this year. Anytime. And I want to thank you for watching. This has been Wisdom Wednesday. <laughs>